Amen. Thank you. I always want prayer whenever I can get it. You know what I mean? I need it. All right. Well, it's good to see some new faces out here. That's awesome. Welcome to Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, uh, hopefully people came around and gave you a real uncomfortable hug or something like that or whatever. But if not, I bet they will before you leave. So, um, Man, I've missed you guys. I hope everybody had an awesome Christmas and, and New Year's and stuff. Uh, I know that that season can be a little bit difficult for some people. Um, but you know what? God loves us very much. And He is the great physician. He is the one that heals. He's the one that can bring hope and peace and comfort. And uh, we're here to glorify His name. So this morning, we're going to talk about shame. I was reading through the Word and, and uh, in Genesis, started, started looking at Adam and Eve and, and their whole you know, creation and, and their existence and then what they decided to do on their own and what all that brought forth. And then it, it took me down this, this long journey of looking at shame, looking at shame inside myself, looking at, at shame that the world is under and, and things that we have to deal with and struggle with. Uh, and shame a lot of times feels, it feels like we go through it alone, you know, like we're the only one. And it's like, what in the world, man? Satan tries to, tries to just put this on us like a heavy mantle, like a wet coat or something. And, and we feel embarrassed and we feel like, like we don't want anybody to know. And we don't want anybody to know. But we're going to have some, uh, some interesting discussion about that today. Hopefully we bring up some, some things that make you think, some things that make you reevaluate your feelings inside and reevaluate how you deal with shame. So the first question that I have is, have you ever felt the sting of shame? And the way that that's worded, the sting of shame, is purposeful because shame stings. It does sting. It hurts. It's painful. It's uh, embarrassing. Have you ever been caught doing something that you know that you shouldn't have been doing? Nobody wants to raise their hand, right? <laughs> I'm, asking, I'm asking these questions because I have, okay? Because I have. You knew better, but now you have to face the music. You got caught, you know? You thought, man, I'm getting away with it. No, you're not. Nope. No, I'm not. No, we're not. We're not. But we won't get away with it. Maybe you've done something in secret and haven't been caught yet, but just knowing that God knows is eating you up with guilt and shame. You haven't been caught, but there's that little bit inside you that makes you think or makes you wish, man, I, I kind of wish I would be caught because I'm sick of constantly feeling this because I'm sick of constantly looking over my shoulder. When I was in law enforcement, I arrested a guy one time. Whenever you come in contact with people, you have to, you have to run them. You know, you you take it, their information and you call it into dispatch or punch it into your mobile data terminal, and you need to make sure that they don't have any outstanding warrants for their arrest. You need to make sure that they don't have a history of extreme violence against law enforcement or something. You know, you might be in trouble. You might be in in danger. So I run this guy, and and he comes back as a as a fugitive, he escaped prison, which I think is super cool. I mean, good job. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that you should, but I'm saying if you can, that's pretty wild. You know, that's, that takes a lot. And he had, and he had been on the run for so long, so long, like 30 or 40 years, something crazy like that. And I'm like, this can't be right. 
There's no way this can be right. You can't avoid that that long. And I get him in the back of my car. Super nice guy, by the way. Super good guy. Nice guy. And we're driving, we're driving to the police station. And he says, hey, I just want to thank you. I'm like, what? He says, I want to thank you. I've been looking over my shoulder for the last 40 years, wondering when I was going to get caught. He's like, it was, it was devastating. And I said, wow, man, I, I appreciate you being, you know, so, so transparent and stuff with me. Um, but that was weighing on him. That guilt, that shame, that feeling was just weighing him down. And it was a relief when he got caught. Have you ever been relieved when you got caught doing something that you know that you shouldn't do? I have. And it was because I didn't want to do it. Deep down inside, I didn't want to be living that life, making those choices because I knew they were bad for me. I didn't want to get caught. So what's the definition of shame? We're talking about shame today. The definition is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrongful or foolish behavior. That's a, that's a pretty good definition. Some other words that you can use for shame are humiliation, mortification. You ever been mortified <laughs> when you got caught? Ooh, I know that feeling. Embarrassment, remorse, guilt, discredited, dishonor, self-disgust, self-reproach ill reproof, or degradation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll have your way here today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll open our eyes and reveal to us exactly what it is that you want us to receive from this word today. Lord, I pray that you'll open our eyes to the truth about shame, that you'll open our eyes eyes and our hearts to the fact that, that you are the one that overcomes that, that you are the only way to get that out of our lives, God. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me, Lord, and just allow this word to be planted and rooted deep down in our hearts. Lord, help us to receive it today by the help of your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll try not to keep drinking out of that water bottle today. So what gives power to shame? Shame does have power. It does. It generates from somewhere, right? So the origin story, if you will, to shame, like we talked about a little bit, is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. It says, And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That's the last verse in Genesis chapter 2. They were naked, and they felt no shame. I promise you, if I was standing up here today, and I was naked, I would certainly feel shame. <laughs> uh, at times, I read this, and I'm like, I think it is good to all wear clothes now. You know, honestly, I really do. Um, but Adam and Eve... They were naked, and they didn't feel any shame. None. None whatsoever. But what, what brought about that shame was disobedience. It was corruption of the way that, that God created things, the way that things were supposed to be free. Totally free. We hear this word free all the time. We live in a free country, right? No, we don't. But we live in a free country. Kind of. We're supposed to be free, but free, the true meaning of free, and what we know is free, they're not really the same thing. They're not. And so in Genesis 3, 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard a sound in, in the garden. And so I jumped from when they felt totally free, when they were totally free, they were naked, running around free. They sinned, Okay. Eve specifically did something that God 
straight up told her not to do. And then Adam, right there, totally went along with it. Everybody's like, well, Eve's the, Eve's the one at fault. <laughs> Whatever, man, Adam was literally right there. And he did what he also knew he wasn't supposed to do. Believe me, this doesn't just fall on you, ladies. This is absolutely us too. Us men. So they sin. They do exactly what God tells them not to do because it would bring forth death. And Satan says, no, it's not going to actually bring death. It'll really bring life because you're going to be like God. And then God himself says, well, now they are like us. Because they know good and evil. And now they're going to die. Because before, they didn't, we didn't have to deal with that. We didn't have to deal with death because we weren't created for death. So they sin. And then after they sin, shame comes in. Significant shame. Painful shame. Scary shame. Embarrassing shame. It says in Genesis 3.8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they heard from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? God knew right where he was, right? Of course he did. He's God. But he called to him, Where are you? You know... This shame that they were feeling, it didn't just hurt them. It hurt God. It hurt God's heart. It affected Him deeply because He created us for relationship. Think about your own children, those of you that have children. Think about it. Do you ever want your kids to feel shame? No. No, of course not, because we know what that feeling feels like and it's horrible. We don't want anybody else. If you, if you don't have kids, think about somebody else that you love so much and what it does to you whenever they feel shame. It hurts you too, right? This hurt God too. God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? See, whenever I first read this, it makes me think, it makes me read it in the, in the sound that I think, that I, that I first think that God would be saying it, which is like a voice of condemnation. But I don't think that that's true. He asked him, who did this to you? Who did this to you? I think that's where he was really upset. He was hurt because he knew that he's a just and a righteous God and that something had to be done now because of it. So he knew that they would have to be punished. He knew that there was going to be consequences to their actions because there's always consequences, equal to or opposite reaction for everything that we do. So he knew that there had to be correction, and correction hurts. Correction is painful so that we don't do it again. So Jesus, or God in the, in the garden says, who told you you were naked? He knew, but he wanted them to declare it. He wanted them to know for sure who it was that did this to them and not God himself. They were influenced by sin. They were influenced by Satan. And because they went along with it, now they're going to have to deal with this. Who told you you were naked? Who put this on you now? So that they would have to speak that out. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Genesis 3.21 says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. So after they had all this conversation, God himself then provides for them. He says, you're going to have to deal with these consequences. God then took an animal, while they were still sinners, took an animal. They tried covering themselves with leaves. You know, he's like, that's not going to work. <laughs> let's, let's fix this, okay? He makes clothes for them to protect them. Because now, he knows they're going to have to go out of the garden. You don't get to stay in paradise anymore. You made the choice 
And now you don't get to stay here. I wanted you here. I made you for this place, and I made this place for you. But now you don't get to stay here. Out there is going to be rough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be cold. It's going to be wet. You're going to suffer. You're going to struggle. Let me give you something to help you while you go. He still provides clothes for them. That's just, you know. We have to see the Father's heart here. We've got to see His heart here. He wants to bring correction. Now He knows you've sinned. You've brought sin into the world. I'm going to have to fix this. You can't fix this. You can't fix it on your own. You broke it with the help of the enemy, but I'm going to have to fix it. That's why the Word says that from the foundations of the world, of the world Christ was crucified. I'm going to have to fix this for you now. As parents, don't we fix a lot of things for our kids? Whenever they get into, into something that they shouldn't have gotten into, my parents fixed a whole lot, a lot. Some things even they couldn't fix. What's our first instinct when we sin, whenever we do something that we know that we shouldn't do, whenever we know it's not right to do? What's the definition say? It says, humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrongful or foolish behavior. We consciously did this. We knew it was wrong. We did it anyway. And now we have this guilt, shame, and remorse and all this stuff. What's our first instinct whenever we do something stupid that we knew we shouldn't have done? We try to hide, right? The first instinct from Adam and Eve was to hide from God. In Genesis 7 through 11, they tried to hide from God. Let me tell you, friends, you can't. Nowhere that you go, no matter high how, no matter how high, no matter how low, no matter how far that way or that way, you can't get away from him. Even if you want to get away from him, you can't. Because he doesn't want to get away from you. And he's omnipresent. He's literally everywhere. So when you're there all by yourself in the dark, and you feel like you're totally alone, he's right there. Literally right there. You might not feel like it. The enemy might be trying to tell you he's not there. He's not there. He can't hear you when you call him. He doesn't want to hear you because this was so bad. This was so bad. Why would God want to be with you? Why would God want to listen to you? You even knew God didn't want you to do this. He's told you not to, and he's freed you from it before, and here you are again. Does that sound familiar? Why is running our first instinct? They realized, Adam and Eve realized, and we realize, that we're guilty before God. That's the first and foremost. They knew there was one thing God told me I couldn't do, and I did it. There was only one, literally only one thing that God told them they couldn't do. There were zero other restrictions, none whatsoever. That's living in freedom. They realized they were guilty before God. They realized they were vulnerable to each other now and to Satan in a whole new horrible way. They were vulnerable in a whole new way that they had never been vulnerable before. Instantly, Literally, instantly, they were sinful, they were weak, they were damaged. They realized all of their, their downfalls now. They didn't have these downfalls before. Under God's righteous judgment is where they were. They found themselves there. They had never been there before. And I believe that they had been in the garden for a long time. We, we read this story... And because it's in Genesis 2 is whenever this thing starts, we think, well, this, this didn't take very long. <laughs> yeah, it did. It could have taken a long, 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 long time before this one action happened. But now 
They had walked with God forever. Like their entire lives, literally, they were right there with God, communicating with Him. And this was the first time, boom, that they were totally separated from Him. I, we could go way deep into that, but I can't even fathom how, how horrible that felt, how difficult that was. We look at Jesus on the cross, and He says, Father, why have you forsaken me? That's because the Father had to turn His face from Him. It was the first time ever that Jesus didn't have the presence of God with Him. That was excruciating to Him, and that's probably pretty similar to what Adam and Eve were feeling at that point. And that's what we feel too. We feel that we're under this righteous judgment, right? And it's what Satan is just hammering into us. They were exposed to other sinners and other sinners' sinful judgment against them. That's, that's why they were clothing themselves, because now they, Adam realizes, Eve might judge me. And Eve realized, well, Adam might judge me, you know. It's that, that pressure coming down on them. They were fearful of rejection, I think. I think that that's why they were covering themselves. Part of it was fearful of being rejected by the other. They were open to lawful condemnation and accusations from the evil one. Before, they didn't have these accusations coming against them. They were being protected. Now, Satan did talk to Eve. He did come up and he started speaking to her and making accusations about what God said. But I believe before this that they were protected from that. Proverbs 18.13 says, To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. To answer before listening is folly and shame. Eve's being talked to, and she's, she's hearing what's going on, but she doesn't think it all through, you know? And she answers, she starts speaking to him before she's thinking about it before she has an opportunity to really process through it. And that says that that is, is folly, and it's shame. That brings shame. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about things that, that can bring shame, that do bring shame. And I've got, I'll tell you in advance, I've got a lot of Scripture verses that I even had to cut out. Like, I could have taught this whole thing just on Scripture verses alone. But... We also live in this dangerous world and have the same instincts to hide ourselves. Adam and Eve, they were kicked out of the garden. They were kicked into the rest of the world. We live in that world. We felt these pressures. All kinds of pressures. Sin is alive in our bodies, Romans 7.23 says. That this, this flesh is sinful. We have a sinful nature. That makes it easy to step right into sin. We are, Hebrews 5 uh, verse 12 says that we are beset with weakness. We have weakness in us. It's just the natural, the natural way that we are now that there is sin in the world. But let's think about what shame is. Shame is a mixture of failure and pride. Whenever we fail at something, we, we feel like people are judging us. We feel like that we don't add up. We don't amount to enough, right? Failure can bring shame. But I think the biggest thing that brings shame, that causes so many other things, is pride. Is pride. Pride is... There's, there's a whole laundry list of what makes up pride. We think of pride as, as somebody that thinks that they're all, all cool and all great and all that stuff. That's not all what pride is. Not even close. There's so much more to it than that. That is part of it. But there's so much more to pride. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs also says, Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Any time that there's pride, there's going to be destruction. Any time that there's pride, there's going to be destruction. The Word says 
that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we have hope here. We have hope. Christ is our hope. I can't wait to get into that part. We fail. So some of our failures, we fail morally, right? We fall into sin. Everybody wants to blame Eve and, and, and you know, Sunday morning, is that what you call it? Sunday morning? Monday morning quarterback? Sorry, I'm not a football person. Baby, what's that quote? Okay. We want to judge Eve, yet here we are. <laughs> here we are, slammed full of sin. Our whole lives, we've been walking in sin. Due to our limitations and weakness, we fail to live up to other people's expectations. All these things come along with pride. We think about that. Pride in ourselves is us worrying about not adding up to someone else's expectations what somebody else thinks that we should be or how we should be or what we should look like, what we should talk like, what we should dress like, what we should, where we should go to church, where we shouldn't. All these different things. And we're worried about what other people think. You know, oftentimes we worry about what somebody else thinks more than we worry about what God thinks, the one that created us, the creator of the universe that put the breath in your lungs, that made the lungs to put the breath in in the first place, We're more worried about what somebody we won't ever see again thinks about us if we say something that maybe might offend them. What if it offends God? What if what they're doing offends God? Is it more important to appease them so that they won't be offended or have their feelings hurt? Or is what God thinks more important? You know, there's a way to address certain things. It's, the Word says to address things in truth and in love. But it has to be addressed in truth. But if you don't address it in love, they're not going to receive it anyway. Sorry, I'm getting ready to go on a rant. <clears throat> because we're full of pride... We're ashamed of our failures and weaknesses. And we will go to almost any length to hide them from others. We'll go, think about how far you will go to hide something so people won't know what you're doing or won't know what you've done in your past, won't know what you still do. What are you willing to do to hide that stuff? That takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort. That God doesn't want. God wants us to put our energy and effort into loving Him and having this relationship with Him so He can free us from all this baggage. So He can set us free from this junk. Pride-filled shame can hold serious power over us. Pride-filled shame can hold serious power over us. It's like it's being in a straitjacket. Anybody know what a straitjacket is still? I don't even know if they use those anymore. But <laughs> uh, It controls significant parts of our lives. We'll ju- do just about anything to avoid being exposed. This causes us to hide. It causes us to want to hide so that nobody can see what we're doing. Maybe because we want to keep doing it but maybe just because it's so embarrassing that we, we, we know that we can't stop doing it on our own, and so we want to hide, and, and we don't want to be exposed. So we find this hiding place where we think that nobody sees us. Our own shame usually makes us hide in all the wrong places. All the wrong places. In our homes, or away from our homes, depending on what it is. In our rooms, maybe. Maybe we lock ourselves away in our rooms. Maybe we don't come home. Maybe maybe we're hiding in our offices. We hide behind entertainment sometimes, right? Instead of addressing issues, we'd rather be on our computers, our phones, 
our earphones, Netflix, you know, Facebook, ESPN. These are all places to hide. They're all things that, that take place or replace where we should be going to get the freedom that we need. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever be able to be on Netflix or, or surfing the web or whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't ever watch ESPN. That's not what I'm saying at all. Not what I'm saying at all. But if we're using that as a facade to, to hide something else, to hide behind, there's a lot of facades. You know what a facade is? It's a fake front. It looks like this on the outside, but on the inside, it's some clandestine, sneaky place. It looks like something different. Some facades that we use could be fashion or education, careers, even a pulpit facade. Anybody ever seen a preacher that is one way standing up here, but another totally different way out there? That's a facade. And people try to use anything to hide behind it. Behind being busy, I'm always too busy to deal with it. Or procrastination, I'll deal with it tomorrow or the next day. Or whenever I get around to it. We hide in outright lies. We hide in diversionary discussions. Anything to not let somebody know the truth. Anything to not face the truth ourselves because it's painful. We hide behind humor or being sad all the time so that people won't talk to us. We hide behind being loud or being timid. Extroverts or introverts. There's nothing wrong with most of these things if it's done with the right heart, you know. We all have our own sin cover-ups, though. Everything that I'm, I'm talking today, please understand that I'm not um, preaching at you, I'm preaching with you, because I know that we all struggle. The Word says that we've all sinned, that we've all come short of the glory of God. When God has me put stuff together, it's, it's not just for you guys. It's as much for me as it is for everybody or anybody. It's like our own testimony, right? Your own testimony, it's not for you. It is for you, but it's for everybody else as much as, as it is for you. There are people out there that have to hear your testimony, what you've been through, what you've done in your past, and what God took you to. Have you ever talked to people that, that just live back here in the past and they only want to talk about, oh, back in the good old days, the good old days weren't that good. Anybody agree? Um, so if we just talk about the bad, stupid things that we did and we don't talk about God's redemptive power and the grace and mercy that He's had on us to set us free from those things, then we're wrong, you know? Our testimony is for God to use to set people free. So how to break the power of shame. Wanting to hide isn't wrong. Like I said, we try to find all these places to hide where people can't see, and that's not wrong. Wanting to hide isn't wrong necessarily. It's wanting to hide in the wrong places that's wrong. We just need to hide in the right place. And only Jesus offers the protection that we seek. Only Jesus offers the protection that we seek. You can't find it on your own. You can't find it anywhere else. I don't care what anybody tells you. You can't find it in self-help books. You can't find it in counseling. Are these things helpful? Absolutely, they're helpful. Very helpful. You can't find it in your friend, unless your friend is leading you to Jesus to, to point you back there. We need all these things. But He's the only thing that will set you free from this. The only thing. There is no other answer. There is no other way. There's not. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20. And this is just a short snippet out of there. 
The refuge of Jesus Christ is where all of our shame is covered and we no longer need to fear. It says five different times in Psalms that God will protect us with His wings. With His wings. Tiny rabbit trail. Anybody ever wondered if we're going to be able to fly in heaven? I mean, I, I, I don't... I think it'd be super cool. Do I think we're all going to be these little cherubs floating around on a cloud strumming a harp? No. No, I think that would be a little odd. But this says that God protects us with His wings. Have you ever read in Revelations or in Daniel or Isaiah what what the angels in heaven look like? They're stinking wild, man. They are so awesome. But a lot of them have wings. And this says that God protects us with His wings, that He protects us, that that we can run to Him, that He is our place of refuge and our ever-present help in time of need. When you are feeling shame, when you're feeling that bondage and that oppression, that is your time of need. And He says that He's your ever-present help in that time, that you can run to Him, and those who do run to Him will be saved. You don't have to stay in that. Jesus' death and resurrection is the only remedy for the shame that we feel. His death and resurrection. When when God told Adam and Eve, you got to go. You got to step outside of the garden now. Because of your decision, you can't stay here anymore. Like I said, he knew that he had to make the way. Because we couldn't do it on our own. That way is that pure and spotless lamb being sacrificed for us, for our sins. He's the only remedy. Romans 5.5 says, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. It's been given to us. This is awesome, guys. I'm about to get worked up. Acts 4.12, there's nowhere else to go. And there is salvation in one, in no one else, there's salvation in only one. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I don't care who tells you that there's another way. No matter who it is, if they tell you there's another way, they're wrong. I promise, I promise you. If we hide in Jesus, He cleanses us completely, completely. And 1 John 1, nine tells us that if we hide in Him, He cleanses us. So it's our filth that we need protection from. If we hide, when you hide, you need protection from something. And His, His love cleanses us. He's the only one that can cleanse us and make us clean. And when that happens, all God's promises become ours if we believe and we receive them. If we run to Him, all the promises of His Word... I want to hold this up, you know, like if I had my Bible in my hand, I'd be holding it up. And this, I do use this as a Bible, but I'm like, do I hold this up? Like, Just picture that this is my Bible for now, okay? All the promises that He gives us in His Word are for us. And they can all be ours whenever we do run to Him and whenever we accept that. You realize that you have to accept it? You have to seek Him. You have to seek Him out as the refuge, as the hiding place. And whenever you do and whenever you find Him, He's giving it to you. He's going to protect you. Adam and Eve didn't have to accept the clothing that that God gave them in the garden. They didn't have to. They could have thrown it off and said, eh, you know what, I got it. They didn't have to take it. They did. That was probably a smart move. We don't have to accept what He gives us. But if we do, all of His promises are now ours. They're ours. They're for us. He's promising these things for us. His all-sufficient grace flows from these promises to us through faith. You have to accept it in faith and provide protection and redemption from all our shameful wickedness and failures. 
That's 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It's in the Word, and He tells us that His all-sufficient grace protects us from all of our own shameful wickedness and our failures. Isn't it great to know that it's okay? That His grace is what gives that to us? And literally, all we have to do is seek Him. The Word says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek Him first, and then He's going to provide everything else for you. He's going to provide, and all you have to do is receive it. Humility will break the power of pride-fueled shame. So shame has power. Pride-fueled shame has a lot of power. And one simple thing, humility can help break that power over you. Have you ever felt like, well, I just can't stop doing this stupid crap that I'm doing, whatever it is? I just can't stop. Yes, you can. Humility can help us, and we have to humble ourselves. The Word says if we humble ourselves, seek His face and pray that God will heal our nation, that God will heal us. We have to humble ourselves first, though. It's that pride that says, I'm not going to go to anybody else. I'm not going to talk to anybody else. I can't tell my father about this. Look at everything he's already done for me. By not going to him, that's staying in pride. That is pride that's keeping you from going to him in the first place to receive the freedom that you need. It's pride that keeps you from doing that. Humility is the opposite of pride. Humility is the opposite of pride. The superior power of humility-fueled faith is in the work and promises of Christ Jesus. You realize that He's the one that gives us the strength and the power to be able to come to Him in the first place? And without Him, we are nothing. We're powerless. We're powerless. But it's pride that says, I'm not going to go to Him. It's pride that says... I can't go to him. You're believing a lie. Think about this. Jesus is hanging out there with his disciples and, and they say, how many times should I forgive my brother that sins against me? Seven times? Jesus says no. And he, re he replies with an answer that would be literally impossible. Seventy times seven in one day. Jesus, God himself, said this. Forgive over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. If that's coming out of Jesus' mouth, he says, I only do what I uh, see the Father doing. I only say what the Father tells me to say. And he said to do it over and over. The Father's telling him, this is how we forgive. We forgive as many times as we need to. So whenever you're stuck in this bondage of sin, you're being held there by pride, and Satan's whispering in your ear saying, you can't go to the Father. You just did this, and you asked forgiveness, and He, forgive, he forgave you. What's He going to think whenever you come again and ask for forgiveness for the same thing? You think that's okay? You think it's okay? He wants you to believe that it's not okay. But if God the Father told Jesus, this is exactly how we forgive. As many times as necessary, when you come to the Father, you repent and you come to Him, guess what you get again? Forgiveness. Have you ever heard people say, well, I just put Jesus back on the cross. You can't put Him back on the cross. He's not going back on the cross. Because He came off that cross victorious. He doesn't go back on the cross. It's not contingent on you. If you think that, that something that you can do has the power to put Jesus back on the cross, you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not can be saved, not might be saved. Not, uh, it's possible they could be saved. It says, 
everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Psalms 103.13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. That fear means revere, have reverence for him, love him, honor him. Just like a father has compassion on their children. And you know what? Sometimes us earthly fathers, we're wrong. We get it wrong. Last night, I got it wrong right before I went to bed. Last night. Sometimes we get it wrong. But our Heavenly Father doesn't get it wrong. He doesn't get fathering you well wrong. So if, if you read this verse right here, as a father has compassion on his children, and you think my father didn't have compassion on me, I'm sorry. We earthly fathers get it wrong sometimes. Sometimes more than we get it right. But he doesn't. He has compassion and he gets it right every time. Even whenever we do have to go through a little bit of hard, painful correction, that's not him getting it wrong. That's him getting it right. Shame pronounces over us Guilt, shame pronounces over us a deficit. Shame says, you're never going to be worthy. You're never going to get it right. You're always going to get it wrong. There's no point in trying. That's what shame pronounces over us. But Jesus declared us guiltless. What He did, what He took, His sacrifice on the cross for us, having his flesh ripped off of his body, a crown of thorns beat into his head, suffering, he bore our sin and our shame. He bore our sin and our shame for us. So we don't have to. Can you imagine if we all paid the penalty of sin that Jesus took for us? None of us would be here. No one would be alive. Jesus declares us guiltless. The Word says that He sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf today. Today, that's what He's doing right now. It says He's always at the right hand of the Father, interceding, because Satan not only lies to you, he goes up and he tries to lie, and he tries to point out the fact to the Father in the courts of heaven that look what Nathan did. Look what he did here. See? He doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve you. And by your law, God, he has to pay. And Jesus says, correct, and that debt is paid by me. I did it. I took that pain. I took the penalty of that sin on myself. He bore our sin and shame. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be, or so that we might, might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now we take that last part, by His wounds that you've been healed, as, as all the physical things that we go through. That's not it. That's not it. That is part of it. He has given us the, the ability, and, and He breathed on us uh, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And through this, we do have the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, to cast out demons. All those are a benefit of it. But some of this, by His wounds you have been healed, those things are Him opening up the ability for us to come straight to Him, to come boldly to the throne room of God and say, Father, I have sinned. Forgive me. And He takes that shame, He takes that guilt, He takes that sin and, and throws it away. 2 Corinthians 12, 9-10 says, He promises that His grace is sufficient for us in all of our weakness. Isn't that awesome? His grace is sufficient for us in all of our weakness. He doesn't say, you're not going to have weakness. He says, my grace is sufficient for you in that weakness. And through your weakness, I'm going to show my strength. John 17, he says, 
Father, I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That's what he's wanting for us. He wants us to run to him. He wants to be able to protect us as a father. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I've had kids that have been bullied a little bit, and this righteous anger wells up inside me, and, and I want to kick a kid in the face or something, you know? That's our father, too. You know, he doesn't want people to have to, he doesn't want his children to have to deal with that. And guess what happens at the end? Whenever that bully doesn't go away, whenever he doesn't leave us, the father does make him pay. I'm not saying I'm going to go around and kick a bunch of kids in the face. I'm saying I've had that thought, you know, I'm human. Brittany's going, stop. Lamentations 3.22 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassion never fails. You see, guys, we have to learn to trust that Jesus is our righteousness. He's the provider of everything that we need. We aren't, but He is. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every one of our needs according to His righteousness and His glory. Psalms 103.13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And Psalms 103.8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. Anyone else in here really glad that he's slow to anger and abounding in love? Man, I am. Sometimes I look back on my life and I go, I can't believe you let me live. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man, shame will lose its power over us. Shame will lose its power over us. We have to make the right steps. We've got to go to the only one that can take it from us. Think about what happened to the woman at the well whenever Jesus is there. The Samaritan, right? He starts chatting with her. She's living in sin. She's been married five times. The person she lives with now isn't even her husband. She's living in flat out fornication against, against the laws of the Lord. Do you think Jesus knew she was going to be there that day? Of course He did. He knew she was going to be there. He chose her. When you think and you feel, why would God choose me? I'm not worthy. Guess what? That's probably why. I stand up here today saying, I'm not worthy to be standing up here in front of you. But God chooses us because of these things. This woman, she comes face to face with the Savior of the world. With the Savior of all of us from the beginning to the end. He's the answer. And she's face to face with him knowing that she's living in sin. Does he just start berating her? Or, or following out what the, what the law of Moses says, that she should be stoned to death? Jesus didn't pick up a stone and kill her. Could he? Yep. Would he be justified according to the law? Yeah. But he didn't. He loved her. And it was that love that changed her. Think about King David. Dude after God's own heart, an amazing warrior, a passionate lover of God, falls into sin, something that's shameful, sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof, and he wants her, and so he gets her. He's absolutely wrong, 100% wrong, couldn't be more wrong. Gets her pregnant. Kills Uriah, who was one of his mighty men, who, who put his own life on the line for David all the time, would do anything for him, would have died for him if, if David would have just asked. And he takes his wife. Was that deserving of death? Yes. By the law? Yep. But he repented. The woman at the well repented. The Bible is full 
of sinners who repent and God changes their lives. God says that David was a man after my own heart. He forgave him. He was willing to forgive them. He's willing to forgive you. No matter how many times you mess up, he's willing to forgive you. You can't do it on your own. Jesus can use our shame, the things that cause us shame, to showcase his grace. If you're willing to let him, if you're willing to humble yourself, if you're willing to say, I don't have it all together, I don't make all the right decisions, in fact, here's where I've gone wrong, and you bring it out into the open, Satan has no power over you. It's when we try to hold on to it and keep it concealed up inside that we don't want to let anybody know because then they might think badly of us. God can't turn that into glory for Him. He can't show everybody else, look what I've done with this person. Look how I've healed them. Yes, they were a sinner. Now they're made righteous through me. People need to hear your story. They need to hear your failures. You know, I've, I, I have some friends that are parents that, that they don't ever want to tell their kids where they messed up growing up. They don't want to tell their kids whenever they've done something wrong. Even now, they, they won't even apologize to them. How are your kids supposed to know how to say I'm sorry if they don't hear I'm sorry? How are people supposed to know that we serve a God that forgives us of our sins if we don't tell people that we've been sinners? <laughs> you know what I mean? How's everybody else supposed to know that their Heavenly Father is a forgiving, loving God that's merciful if they don't see it through us? They just think that we're a bunch of, of righteous people that are in, in these walls, you know, that come to this church and they don't do anything wrong. That's why people think that we're hypocrites. Because they know it's not true. They know we've had sin. We have to let people know, look, I've sinned. Don't build that sin up. Build up the forgiveness. Build up the one who saves us from it and pulls us out of that sickness. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. <laughs> Thank you, God. Psalms 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, He has removed our sins from us. Do you know how far that is? No, nobody does, because it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. It's that far. That's how far He's removed it from us. He's removed our sin from us. So whenever we look back, and I can stand here today, I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I have been set free, I've been washed and cleansed by God's grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His righteousness, thank you Jesus, but I can still look back and see it. But when God looks at me, and Satan's sitting there trying to accuse me, God doesn't see it because it's been covered by the blood of Jesus. So people say, well, God can't forget anything. God chooses to forget it. And if God chooses to do something, He can do whatever He wants because He's God. And if He chooses to do it, then it is. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Their old life is gone, and their new life has begun. Friends, I want to tell you today that shame has no place in your life. If you're struggling with shame, if you're struggling with guilt, you're struggling because you can't seem to get it right, that you keep doing the same thing over and over again, that's not for you. It's not for you. And you can be released from it today. Today. If you do suffer with it, if you do struggle with it, you don't have to walk out this door still carrying that baggage with you. You can leave it here. The Word says to cast your cares onto Him, to take on His yoke, because His burden is light.
His yoke is easy for us to take. He wants to take it from you. All you have to do is let go of it. That's it. Just let go of it. Renew your mind. Allow your spirit and your body to be renewed. That's what He truly does want for you. We're going to close today. We're going to have a little bit of uh, just some worship going on. The altars are going to be open. Several of us will probably be up here and around for prayer. So please feel free to come up. Please feel free to get prayer. If you want somebody to help walk you through this, do it. Don't be ashamed. The people that are up here that are going to be praying for you, probably done worse. Okay? I promise. But we've been redeemed. We've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. If you have kids, don't forget to pick them up whenever you're leaving. That'd be weird if we had to take care of them. Who knows how they're going to turn out. But uh, <laughs> if you do, they'll probably still be here next week when you get here. But guys, I love you. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your cleansing power for your love and your mercy, your kindness, your generosity, your favor over us, the fact that you still bless us. You've created us in your image, God, to look like you. You've created us in your likeness to be like you, God, to have this relationship with you, to truly find freedom. Lord, I pray that bondages will be broken off of people today. I pray that whoever's struggling with this and that, that they feel... Uh, just fear and anxiety and worry. They feel not good enough, that they're not worthy to receive this from you, God. I pray that you will break that and that you will silence the lies of the enemy today. I pray that freedom will be declared in this place today by every single one of us, God. Lord, break down these walls, these chains, these bars of bondage that hold us. Help us, God, to see you and help us to see your heart, your true heart for us, Lord. I pray that everyone that leaves this place today will be walking out in, in a newfound freedom and that all condemnation will leave their minds and leave their spirits in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we love you. I pray that you will give us divine appointments and opportunities to be able to share our story with others that clearly show your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, God. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.